drop by any bike shop and you'll have lots of opinions on the shifting performance of SRAMRED ETAP versus Shimano DI2, but no one's done any objective testing until now. <laughs> Welcome to Gadget Blues. This is KC, and today we have what AVE would call a treat especial. My number one requested feature, a shifting performance comparison between Shimano Dura Ace Di2 9150 and SRAM Red ETAP. You can't watch any bicycle YouTube channel, visit any forum, or read any magazine without seeing some opinions about SRAM Red ETAP versus Shimano Dura Ace Di2. But to the best of my knowledge, no one has done any objective testing of the actual shifting performance, and that's what we're getting to today. So I hope this is going to be a fairly unique experience, and it will be fairly brief and informative. It turned out to be a fascinating exercise for me because what started as a simple group set performance comparison ended up being kind of a journey of discovery between perception and reality. If you've done any training with a power meter, which is a very objective measurement of your performance, you'll note that it starts to give you a insight into the difference between perception and reality. Sometimes you feel like you're putting out tons of watts and when you get home and you look at the data, you were not. Other times it seems like you were just moving along at a medium pace and you were in fact actually hammering. So we know from that that there is a big gap between perception and reality. And going into this test, my perception was that the front shifting was significantly slower on the ETAP and the rear shifting was about the same between the two. Both of those assumptions turned out to be wrong. The way I perform this test is I have a GoPro Hero 5 Black and this camera is capable of shooting at 240 frames per second at 720p. So I set this up to look at the front or the rear derailleur for the different tests I was doing. And I obtained one of these adapters that allows you to plug a three and a half millimeter external microphone into the Hero 5 Black. That goes into this big extension cable and into a lavalier microphone accessory, which I took off like that and electrical taped directly to the shifting switch. This means that on the video, I captured the sound of the switch at the very second that I pressed it. And I could see that waveform when I dropped the video into my editor and do the timing of the frames based on that exact moment I hit the switch. So this is specifically a test of the time it takes from when you hit the switch to when the shift is completed. And by complete, I mean that the chain is effectively wrapped around the next cog and is producing power. This is not tremendously expensive gear, so if you have or are considering a Hero 5 Black, if you pick up one of these 3.5 millimeter microphone adapters and a lavalier mic, you can duplicate these results fairly easily. And I'd like to see your results because of course they can vary from bicycle to bicycle and person to person. However, I think my results are pretty repeatable and are very valid. I measured four different things in this test, front shift up, front shift down, rear shift up, and rear shift down on both the Shimano and the ETAP. And each one of those I performed 13 times. So that's a whole lot of data that I ended up plugging into Excel for analysis. At 240 frames per second, that means 4.167 milliseconds per frame of video. So what I would do is look at the frame where the waveform started for the initial down click of the button and time from there until I saw the chain effectively wrapped around the next cog. For the rear shifting, I did the shifts between cogs five and six of an 11 speed cassette. Recall that my assumption going into this from writing both of these group sets for several months was that the front shifting was dramatically slower on ETAP and the rear shifting was on par. Okay, keep that in mind. So here we have front shift up and SRAM is slower by 14.4%. 
That's an average of 780 milliseconds for the ETAP and 681 for the Shimano. 14.4% is significant, but it's not the big difference that I perceived out on the road. So right away, we're correcting my perception with objective reality. And look at the difference in those numbers. 780 versus 681, that's a 100 milliseconds difference average. And bear that 100 milliseconds in mind because that will come back later in this discussion. For our second test, we have the front shift down. That is from the large to the small chainring in front. And in this one, we see that ETAP is a little inconsistent. They actually have three shifts that are faster than Shimano, but the rest are slower with an average of 13.2%. Once again, we're in the neighborhood of 100 milliseconds difference between these items. And you'll note that I have, in all of these, sorted the shifts from fastest to slowest for charting. That's not how they occurred in real life. They occurred randomly, but they look better on the chart if they're sorted from quickest to slowest. That's the front shifting at about 13, 14% slower for SRAM. Let's take a look at the rear shifting, which you do more often. The rear shifting definitely did not meet with my expectations of being about the same between SRAM and Shimano. We are seeing on the rear shift down, that is from the COG-5 to COG-6, 28.3% slower on SRAM ETAP. And that is very consistent across these shifts. You can see these lines are fairly parallel. Looking at the numbers, although this is a much bigger difference in percentage than in the front shift, we see that because the shifts on the back are faster across the board, the difference here is still that magic 100 milliseconds approximately. Finally, we have the results for the rear shift up from the cog six to cog five, large to small. And on this one, we see the ETAP is a staggering 52% slower than Shimano. That really threw me for a loop because it feels pretty similar. On uh, this one, we're seeing a lot more than 100 milliseconds. It's about 332 average for 9150 and 505 for ETAP. So why is the ETAP slower? Well, a lot of folks will tell you that that's the way that it is, that the ETAP is basically an Ultegra level group set that has its advantages mainly in its wireless nature for ease of install and compatibility with frames that aren't DI2 ready. And all of that is true. But part of it is because the group set is in fact wireless. There's the mechanical part of shifting itself, but I'm measuring from the moment you press the button. And that's why we get this dichotomy between the perception and the reality, because we're feeling the time it takes for the shift to happen. But what really matters when you're out racing, and especially in a fast moving environment like a crit, is the time between you hitting the button and the shift completing, not the time just the shift takes. Imagine if you hit the button and five seconds later the shift occurred. It doesn't matter how fast the shift itself was because you wasted five seconds. If we look at the figures for a Bluetooth latency, it's not unusual at all to see 100, 150 milliseconds latency across Bluetooth, and they are probably using similar protocols in ETAP wireless. I mentioned that 100 millisecond number that you should remember that, and I think that we are seeing a latency of about 100 milliseconds just for the wireless transmission on the ETAP, and that plays a big part in the difference in speed between the group set. If it weren't for that wireless latency, they would be about on par for front shifting instead of 14% different, and they would be a lot closer on rear shifting than the 38 and 52% difference that we're seeing. Remember, those percentages look bigger on the rear because we're talking about a quicker shift in general, so 100 milliseconds makes a bigger difference there. So to summarize what we've discovered today, the ETAP is definitely slower objectively than the 9150, and a lot of that is because it's wireless. So the wireless nature of ETAP is a terrific boon to a lot of folks. It saves bicycle manufacturers and shops money on installation because it's a lot quicker to put together. It's easier for home mechanics to install because it doesn't require those wires. 
but you are paying a performance penalty for the wireless nature of the group set. And if Shimano turned their Dura-Ace into a wireless version, they would see an additional latency along with that as well. Writing both of these on the road, I have them on identical frames, so this comparison test was very even. Both Track Madone 7s on 54 centimeter, and they perform great on both of those bikes. I have a lot of fun riding both of them. I don't notice a performance difference after the first 10 minutes where I figure out which buttons do which because you have to have a little bit of mental adjustment if you have both of these and you switch back and forth. But after that little bit of reminder and adjustment period, I find they both work just dandy. I would go for the 9150 because it is just faster overall and a little bit more positive in the button presses, but your mileage may vary. I'm not a Shimano or a SRAM fanboy. I have no skin in the game here. I don't work for either company. I don't own a bike shop or anything like that. I own both of these. I bought them with my own money and I enjoy both of them. You will have a good time with either of these group sets. Just take this data that I have and put this into the puzzle of how much money you want to spend and what kind of performance you're looking for. What kind of writing do you do? Is it in a fast paced environment? like crit racing, something where you really need to be shifting a lot. You could benefit from the extra speed of the Dura-Ace in those engagements more than you would in ordinary flat road racing. I think sprinters in particular, uh, I'm a sprinter slash puncher and therefore I am really sticking with the 9150 for competition purposes. But again, both great group sets, both are recommended. That's our video for today. I hope you found this data as fascinating as I did, and especially the bit about perception versus reality. We should keep an eye on that sort of thing across the rest of our bicycle experiences. You know, there's a lot of uninformed opinions and snake oil and so forth in the bike industry, and so we need more objective testing. I'll try to continue doing this sort of thing, anything that doesn't require a wind tunnel because that's outside of my resources, but I will be looking into more timing and differences between other bike tech in the future. So be sure to like and subscribe and we will see you in the next Gadget Blues.